Um, I just really want to begin by asking Margaret Byers to stand up, please. Margaret is our very latest recruit working for the SPUC Education and Research Trust uh, uh, and the Abortion Recovery Care Helpline, formerly known as British Victims of Abortion, run by Margaret Cuffield. Please stand up, Margaret. I want also, please, if um, John Brown, are you here, John? Will you stand up, please? Uh, John Brown is a dear friend and associate of SPUC, a collaborator and advisor over many years. Um, we played a very important role working together, fighting for the Constitution and ensuring that pro abortion legislation didn't go through in Ireland 12 years ago. That pro abortion le legislation would have gone through 12 years ago if John Brown hadn't been giving us very good advice all the way through, uh, and if his sister, Dharma Rosemary Scallon, who's visited us many times in the past, hadn't been such a champion for it. So thank you, John, and thank you to your family. And I'm very proud of the Society's Association with you. Um, and um, I just uh, must mention, otherwise I'll be shot, um, this application form to join the Society. Um, and it is a very easy to use application form which you can go up to people you know who may be disposed well towards the Society and they can join instantly. They don't even have to hand over any money. And, um, <laughs> and if they put their email address, we can write to them and encourage them to subscribe to Spuck's email services and thus save money. So there's some of those forms at the back. And I just really also want to remind you that 40 Days for Life, an excellent organisation, begins their campaign of awareness um, starting September 24th, or Wednesday, until November the 2nd. So, um, another thing, on December the 3rd, there's going to be a mass for Alison Davis, somewhere in London, celebrated by a former member of staff, Father Brendan Gerrard. Anyone interested in that mass, uh, do please uh, let us know. You can write to me personally, and uh, I will give you the details of when, we, when, when we've got them. Now, I was discussing with Matthew McCusker, my personal assistant, what I would say in this way ahead talk to conference, and he reminded me of a dictum or advice from Cardinal Newman, in which he's something of an expert, and he said that any sermon, which this is not, of course, uh, should have just one subject, one theme. And we've actually extended that theme throughout the entire conference, and it's leadership. The fact, as Jim Hughes made clear, everyone here is a leader. You really are. You've had the insight to come. You know more than anybody else in the country now about the issue because you've got bang up to date on things. And there are all sorts of different activities which you can undertake. And if I don't mention one of them that you can undertake, Catherine Hampton and Bob Edwards will personally give your money back for attending this conference. <laughs> 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 now, during my talk, it's three years since our last conference, and I want to reflect on what SPUC and the pro-life movement has achieved in the past three years. And in three years' time, we'll be commemorating the 50th anniversary. And I want to reflect on what SPUC needs to aim to achieve in the next few years. And I want to begin by asking Rosalind Thomas just to come up here and take my place and tell me, tell us all about one important activity which she's approached me about. Hello everyone. 
so John and I have been speaking about this new leafleting initiative which we will be planning for the 50th anniversary of the Abortion Act and specifically for the 27th of October 2017 which is the date when royal assent was given to the Abortion Act um, in 1967. This new leafleting initiative is going to be aimed primarily at young people. Um, the idea of the initiative is very simple, as all good initiatives are. That we go to a busy location, a train station, a shopping centre or something like that, with a large number of leaflets and a group of people. It doesn't have to be a huge group, just a group of people, primarily young people we're aiming for. And the aim is to give out all the leaflets to everybody um, passing, passing by and we hope this will be on a Saturday or a day when somebody can take a leaflet and stop and speak with you. The advantage of this is, of course, uh, that you will be able to speak to members of the public about uh, pro-life issues, about abortion, IVF, euthanasia, which ordinarily you can't do when you're visiting houses, when you're putting them through the, the doors. And one of the reasons why we want this to be aimed at young people is, of course, to get young people involved in branch activities, which is absolutely vital for SPUC, because without the, its branches, SPUC is nothing, you know, it's made up of its volunteers, and that's what makes SPUC great. But also because I feel that young people excel at uh, speaking one-on-one, -on -one. and it changes the face of the pro-life movement when a young person stands up and says, that what they've been told they want, uh, abortifacing of contraception, IVF abortion, they don't want it, and they can say that to somebody face to face, and this is what this initiative allows us to do. So what we're hoping to do is, in the years leading up to 2017, and uh, throughout 2017, we will be doing, um, we'll be sort of practicing this initiative. So we'll be having this all over the country in all different branches where a branch will go out on a Saturday and take these leaflets and just do it for maybe one or two hours or however long they want to do it. And then during 2017 and on the anniversary of um, the establishment of SPUC, uh, we will have this initi initiative being carried out in dozens of locations all over the country. Because imagine what effect that would have uh, on this country uh, if in dozens of locations there were uh, different pro-lifers handing out these leaflets and speaking <coughs> to individuals about these issues, especially young people. That would have a huge effect. So this is our aim. We're going to be doing this, we're going to be launching this, this initiative and, and we really want you to um, take this up and really put your heart and soul into it because um, I think sometimes it's easy to forget that actually this is an urgent issue every day. Every day 550 babies are going to be killed by abortion. So every day we have to be uh, carrying out these uh, initiatives with a sense of urgency. So, thank you. You can see I was talking to Jim Hughes before this conference uh, and getting his ideas. Um, and uh, also, of course, uh, I'm sure that Rosalind has been inspired too by the Project Truth activity in Scotland, uh, so dynamically uh, presented to us. <laughs> now, however good or bad our leadership might have been at local or national level, I do share with Jim the view that it is for the older generation in SPUC to give leadership right now in handing on the right ideas, the best ideas, what we've learned over the past four to five decades to the next generation. That's the leadership which really will count and by which we will be defined or consigned to history, whatever good we might have done. We've got to hand on this work to the next generation who are well in evidence this weekend, thank God, the right ideas, the best ideas, and all that we've learned. Now the next point I'm going to make may be seem to you to be a little bit remote from that, but I hold that it's not. Because a team from STUC is going to be in Rome during the Family Synod with the intention of putting our research and expertise and our connection and association with 
uh, countless uh, individuals around the country and numbers of different associations around the world, I meant to say, in defense of families in the, for the service of bishops attending the synod, as well as affirming families in the unchanging truths of the church's teaching on marriage and human sexuality. Now, these unchanging truths are actually reflected in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So the whole world in 1948 recognised them as unchanging truths for the common good of humanity. But, you know, one of the things that I have learned, and I want to pass it on, and I believe many of us have learned, and this is, I'm speaking, if you like, as an, as an individual, uh, with discernment, not necessarily presenting spuck policy, that the church's teaching on the Catholic Church's teaching on the inseparability and the unity of the unity and procreative dimensions of the sexual act is fundamental to building a culture of life and to um, fighting the culture of death. Ignoring that inseparability has made the serious attacks on life possible. You've only got to think of abortifacia birth control for a start. And you've only got to think of IVF, which separates the unitive and the procreative in a very obvious way. And 24 babies uh, consigned uh, to being frozen or experimented on or discarded or lost in miscarriages. Um, for every baby that is born. And it's also led the world, largely thanks to the dictates of the birth control lobby in education. So this is something, therefore, that these are the sorts of truths, the inseparability issues, which are founded on a concept of a man and a woman united in marriage for life, which is the best protection for unborn children. And we want to be sure that the church doesn't give any kind of ambiguous message to the world. Well, we can't be sure of that, but we can do our level best. And we will be giving the lead as a society for that. The Spuck Executive and the Spuck Trustees have met this weekend to give authority to the officers of the society to go a bit beyond budget to do this terribly important work. And I hope and pray we have your support in doing that. But young people need to know we can't win this battle on our own. The pro-life movement compared to the culture of death, and I don't care if you're talking about America, where everyone is aware of this dynamic activity with this enormous religious population they have in America. They're tiny. Look at the power of Barack Obama and possibly the next US president, and the culture of death. But we have had some successes, and the biggest success we have is that we exist, and we can act as a catalyst, but our main catalytic action must be to fire up church leaders of all denominations, but I hold in particular the Catholic Church because of its unequivocal teaching on life issues. Now, what else have we learned? Jim Hughes spoke about ordinary people doing ordinary, extraordinary things. Uh, and as every good pro-lifer, he was plagiarising Mother Teresa. <laughs> well, he, 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 he admitted it, he wasn't plagiarising, he quoted her. When I first became involved at national level in SPUC in January 1974 as a volunteer to help my predecessor, Phyllis Bowman, I had this bright idea that during the coming year we would start door-to-door -door leafleting. And I'd give it a year, and by that time we should have the whole country covered. <laughs> and I want to tell you encouraging news that in the last 40 years I, I've matured a little bit and I am now giving it three years before we do that. Now actually Paul Tully told me to stop talking that sort of uh, high-flown stuff and be more down to earth. 
we're looking for leaders at the local level from this conference and following this conference for door-to-door -door leafleting campaign. Hey, that's, that's not very imaginative. You've had the same idea for 40 years. Okay, but it hasn't been done. I mean, we need now to focus on it and to do it. The, the, we can't afford to advertise on television, and they wouldn't take our advertisements anyway. The media will only publish uh, us as a soundbite 99% of the time, and that's true all over the world. You might know about the big rallies in Washington. The American public don't, because it's not presented on the American TV. So we have to get that message out ourselves. And leafleting is the cheapest way of doing it. And if it's got a membership form attached, we can get new members. And if we ended up giving millions of these leaflets out, and we reckon that we get three new supporters for every 10,000 leaflets we distribute, you could work out yourselves the mathematics and how that could actually work out. We've really got to do this, and we've got to start now. Now, not everybody is given to this particular task. Some are not capable of walking door to door. But most of the people here today, if not all of you in one way or other, because I've seen uh, people uh, buzzing around in wheelchairs this weekend, and I'm sure that they too can play a role, everybody could think about participating in this in one way or another, and in particular we're looking for leaders <laughs> to take this on. So think about that. The general election. In your pack, you have got a general election questionnaire. And as Bob Edwards said, for the first time, we know when the general election is going to be, May 2015. And we've got uh, several months to prepare. And Paul Tully has worked on a very carefully crafted questionnaire with three questions in it. And those questions are actually the main thing we should be doing to oppose assisted suicide because our advisers saying that, well, Lord Faulkner is probably not going to go any further in this parliament, but it, it could well be that they're working behind the scenes to get a, a future government to give private members' legislation a fair wind in parliament. And you've only got to have a prime minister like... David Cameron, who signals his support for same-sex legislation, or Margaret Thatcher, who signalled her support for human embryo experimentation, and the floating voters in the House of Commons switch sides, and we're, we end up with assisted suicide legislation. So now is the time to be challenging the parliamentary candidates on that. So are you a leader on that? We really do need people to take a lead on that at the local level. Please let us know. Let us know. Um, let Isaac Spencer know. Where are you, Isaac? Hi. Okay, you've got his email. Let him know about the door-to-door -door leafleting. Let Catherine Hampton know whether you're going to be approaching candidates or just get on with it. <laughs> um, one of the questions is about the abortion miscertification and challenging MPs to um, challenge the Secretary of State to uphold the rule of law and to tell doctors to stop misleading women and signing forms whereby unwanted pregnancy is seen as a criterion for abortion. Um, and what Paul has produced here in this abortion miscertification briefing, in my opinion, it's beautifully written, it's masterly, and it's developed out of Paul Tully's, our General Secretary's, profound knowledge over 30 years' experience of the political, medical, ethical and social issues relating to abortion. And if anyone wants to know why I wanted Paul Tully and nobody else to be General Secretary of STUC over the past 15 years, abortion's recertification campaign booklet here will tell you why. And it links up STUC's current door-to-door -door campaign. Um, it's very simple. The arguments are there set out on the front cover and then in an executive summary inside. It would take you ten minutes to read. Read it two or three times 
and you will have in your mind the core of what is happening in Britain and why we have 550 abortions every day, as Rosalind was reminding us. It provides us with the armour for the battle, this project. It gives us the weapon for the battle, and this armour and this weapon will give us all the strength and the intelligent arguments we need for the next stage of SPUC's most important battle of all the battle to protect unborn children and to stop abortions. And we want you to focus particularly on the next anniversary of the Royal Assent of the Abortion Act, 27th of October uh, this year. Um, see if you can lobby leading up to that date, on, on that date, around that date. It happens to be a weekday this year. So if that helps you to focus, focus on that. Uh, but of course it will be continuing after that. But please, this is urgent, it is pressing, and it is important to carry that out. Now the next thing is that the youth conference is taking place on what date, Rosalind? 6th and the 8th of March. Where, Rosalind? Southport. Southport. Yes. So, thank you, Anne. <coughs> Always wanting to promote the North West, it's sad, really. <laughs> uh, no, this is wonderful. Um, can everyone make a little private target? But if you can, just try to get one young person you know to go along. You might not be successful. But as Jim said in another context, adopt a young person whom your branch or you personally can either recommend or sponsor to go along to that youth conference. Let me tell you the great work that uh, Spuck Dundee has done. Helen Kidd, the wife of my very dear friend Mike Kidd, who used to be the director of Spuck Scotland 30 odd years ago. Julie Allison, Joseph Gotham, is that right? Geegan. Geegan, and Rachel Hammond, the final year medical students at Dundee University. They've been involved in their pro life group there, and the Dundee branch have encouraged them to become involved in, for example, street stalls, coffee mornings, and most importantly, Helen tells me, the youth conference. These wonderful people are soon to be doctors, and they are now to embark on their careers. And Julie, Julie Allison, is hoping to study nacrotechnology, the pro-life ethical alternative to IVF. Um, Joseph is studying psychiatry and Rachel palliative care. Such great hope for the future, says Helen. How right. And I'm sure you didn't foresee that when you did it. You just thought, well, we must get somebody there. But you just keep on doing it. So, so important. Um, prayer. You, you know that Spuck is not a religious organisation. We discovered religion. The Founding members of SPUC, none of them were Catholic. They discovered that the Catholic Church was strongly against abortion. And so Catholics began to join. But, you know, we're not an academic organisation. But we don't ban people from using their brains. We're not a, a religious organisation. We don't ban people from praying. We encourage both. And so if there's somebody here who has it in them, to organise a prayer group in your area, to support the leafleting group, like we've got in Spuck Harrow, uh, and to support the other work. That is so important. And it's important because I do believe that in human terms, we really are fighting against impossible odds. There's never been anything like that what's happening in human history. When you think about it, with the sheer numbers of people killed, with same-sex marriage legalised. There's nothing like it in human history. So clearly, prayer is the way forward as part and parcel of this battle. Speaking about getting the churches on side, Gordon Kane has been championing the development over the last several years of parish missions, and we're now ready to roll with Isaac Spencer 
in place. And we're beginning pilots with parish missions. And the idea is to get, uh, to make an appeal to parishes to set up a, a fundraising group for the society, to set up a leafleting group for the society. Not a branch, not a support group, that would, su that would cause confusion with branches, but activity related. And so look out for this, and if you're interested in having um, such an event in your area, in a parish near you, because you know the parish priest might be supportive of that, um, or, or the, the, the pastor in the area might be supportive of that, come to us and we will um, put it on the schedule, I'm sure. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, Gordon, wherever you are on that. Um, one of the things that STUC really does endeavour to do is to work with other organisations, and that's why I'm so pleased we've got the March for Life people here, and do visit their stall, and uh, we'd be delighted um, if people um, support their activity. Now, the achievements since our last conference, what has SPUC been doing over the last few years? You, you already know that with your support we successfully took the Department of Health, Public and Social Security in Northern Ireland to court to prevent them from introducing widespread abortion in Northern Ireland by the back door. That was a hugely significant case, and we had to go back to court to stop the Department of Health getting up to another trick and, um, and, and, and trying to do the same thing by different means. We stopped them that time. We employed the best barrister we could get hold of, and the judge said the Department of Health had to give us our money back. We haven't got the costs back yet. We haven't got they the... pay the price of London lawyers. <laughs> but we've got, we've got a substantial part of them back. Now that was with your support. With your support in 2010, we halted government attempts to make sex education uh, compulsory in schools um, throughout England and Wales. And with your support in 2011, in what has become known as the bedroom abortions case, legal arguments submitted by SPUC's lawyers and actually developed by Paul Tully and accepted by the lawyers, helped to prevent a change in the law that would have allowed abortions to take place in the home. Now, in 2011, too, at the end of the year, I think this is a major achievement. SPUC's National Council, without a single vote against it, the major policy-making body of the society, elected by you, the grassroots volunteers, passed in early December 2011 a resolution to defend marriage. Now that marriage resolution, the solid rock of marriage, the solid foundation of our children's happiness, the family founded on marriage, of course we know and all have personal experience of broken marriages, marriages that are hard to work. But people I know and am closest to recognise that marriage is the solid foundation of future happiness, never mind anything else. But also, of course, it's protective of unborn children, which is why we were so concerned to defend marriage and to oppose same-sex marriage. Now, we need to engage in a peaceful civil war, not with weapons of destruction or hatred or fear of anybody but with the peaceful tools of construction, of love for our children, for everyone's children, with love for family life, based on marriage between one woman and one man for life, in a permanent, exclusive union. The Telegraph, when this same-sex marriage legislation was about to be passed, said it would transform the fabric of society. And they were quite smug about it, even though they'd opposed, for political reasons, rushing the legislation through. We've got to ensure that our bit of the fabric is not transformed and that, therefore, the whole fabric isn't transformed. You know, I was looking at a website called Rainforest Concern, and Rainforest Concern tells us that tropical rainforests took between 60 and 100 million years to evolve, containing, they say, over 30 million species of plants and animals, half of the world's wildlife, and at least two-thirds of 
its plant species. These plants provide food and shelter for many rare animals, they tell us, that depend on the rainforest for their survival. Destroy the rainforest and you destroy protection for that wildlife. And in the same way, marriage between a man and a woman is the natural habitat of children and of unborn children. Destroy that understanding of marriage in society and you destroy the best protection for children. SPUC has published a lot of literature, including serious academic analysis on this subject, which is being used in other countries and in other parts of the world. Thanks largely, I have to say, to the great efforts of Anthony McCarthy, who soon, please God, will be getting his doctorate in bioethics. Pope John Paul II taught in Evangelium Vitae that we cannot hope to pass on the truth about human sexuality. And he was talking about the protection of human life and its implications and its ethical implications if we do not teach people the truth about human sexuality. Sorry, what he said was we cannot, pre we cannot expect young people to absorb the truth about the gospel of life if we don't tell them the truth about human sexuality. Which is why what Antonia was telling us about what is already happening in primary schools with children being taught about same-sex partnerships as perfectly acceptable. We know that same-sex partners are being told, yes, you have a right to children. How? Through IVF. And IVF is one of the most destructive anti-life procedures out there. But how are we going to oppose it when it becomes almost a right attached to same-sex legislation? That out very carefully and in a very measured way in our material. And it's all there for your use. And you know, of course, and I won't go into detail, that with your support in 2012, we took up the battle of the courageous Glasgow midwives, Mary and Connie. And in 2013, they won a unanimous court ruling which upheld their conscientious right of objection and that they were protected by law and they're protected by law now. But you know it's now going to the Supreme Court and, well, it could go either way. We couldn't have done that, made this worldwide stand without your support and without showing leadership. And with your support, in March this year, SPUC held its fifth annual youth conference. And I leave it to you to judge if this was a success for the society when you've heard the following message I received from one of the young participants, Nicola Pope. She said, hello. <laughs> <coughs> Anyone there? That's how I knew it was for me. <laughs> My name is Nicola Pope. I'm 22 years old and work at the Catholic Youth Retreat Centre in the Lake District. I met you very briefly when I came to the Spuck Youth Conference on the weekend. And I feel like I've had something completely new breathed into me. What did you say about St John and all the rest of it? Sorry. <laughs> he lost his head. <laughs> Touche. I've never been to anything like the Spuck Conference before and I didn't know what to expect, but I'd heard of it through my parish priest who once asked me to read a letter of yours to the parish. What I experienced was a group of compassionate, faithful and genuine individuals who gave me back my faith in humanity. I felt enveloped in goodness and a real sense of solidarity in breathing God's love and life into the world in this culture of death. I've always believed that, like you said, politicians can't and won't change the world, but only the conversion of hearts and minds will ever make a difference. I came back from the conference and tried to tell somebody about where I'd been on the weekend and what the general ethos and mission of SPUC is, and my wholehearted agreement with it. And with the reaction I got, exactly what you said at the last talk about the battle came completely to light. I realised how hard it is and how hardened hearts have become, and it may be very sad, but even more determined to live a life of love and witness which cares nothing but the life of, which cares for nothing but the life and welfare of others, whether it be inside or outside of the womb. I've always, always been pro-life. I'm quite positive I was pro-life before I even realised there was an option. 
But since the conference, I feel more passionately about it and more than anything I've ever felt passionate about. And I want to thank you and all who are part of SPUC for your dedication, your love, your compassion, your encouragement and your inspiration. Love and prayers always. So, you know, please... someone along to the youth conference, uh, make that one of your aims. And during the past year, as every year, STUC's outreach to schools in England and Wales and STUC Scotland's outreach to schools have taken the pro-life message to thousands upon thousands of young people in schools with well-qualified, trained staff and volunteers. Now just in case, like Bob, you think I've taken leave of my senses, uh, I've been talking about the good news of Spuck's achievements. Here's the bad news. Here's the setbacks we've had since the last conference. Under British abortion legislation, well over 500 little girls and little boys suffer lethal violence in the womb every day, and over 8 million unborn children have been killed under the British abortion law since the Abortion Act came into force in 1968. Children, including Catholic children, under the age of consent, are given access to abortion without the knowledge of their parents, and in Catholic schools this is happening with the cooperation of Catholic authorities. So young people, this needs to be challenged firmly. Just get on with it, but you can get in touch with us for advice. <laughs> Teachers in British primary schools are being trained by Stonewall, a militant homosexual rights group, which has a policy that boys must be taught that they might grow up to marry a man and that little girls must be taught they might grow up to marry a woman. And training by Stonewall for teachers is also happening in Catholic primary schools with the cooperation of the local Catholic authorities. And I went to Rome about this and I saw Cardinal Ouellette of the Congregation for Bishops because he asked me why did I think I was needed to be the guardian of Catholic orthodoxy in Britain. And I said, OK, as I get older, Your Eminence, I try to go wiser, and I pray that I will. But can you just answer me, what do, I, what do we do when this sort of situation exists? And he said, you go along to talk to the local bishop and so on. Well, we've got other thoughts, and, you know, keep in touch with us. Why is all this happening? It's happening because there's an unequivocal campaign and political determination on the part of the most powerful politicians throughout the world and the most powerful United Nations bodies and international Planned Parenthood funded by our governments to promote these evils around the world. One of the first things Barack Obama did, he sent an ambassador to the UN to say that that was the Obama administration's policy and Hillary Clinton spelled it out, abortion on demand in every country of the world. The United Nations um, Secretary General for Human Rights wants to police nations around the world to ensure that there aren't pro-life doctors breaking the law criminally by, not, uh, uh, by refusing to carry out abortions, to police objection to abortions. This is the context in which the Glasgow midwives are having to fight so hard. And there's an unequivocal determination on the part of the world's most powerful politicians to destroy parental rights over their children's education and formation. If you went to Pat Buckley's excellent uh, workshop, you probably heard about that. The pro-life movement, however hard-working, however well-informed, however blessed and strong we might be in our initiative, we can't defeat this culture of death on our own. And we need to be fortified by the strong support of religious leaders all over the world. Uju, one of our more popular speakers this weekend, I rather fancy, said about her Nigerian conference of bishops, and I quote, these are the men I will follow into battle. Doesn't that tell us something about the kind of society we need to build. You know, you notice I haven't played down our achievements. We're there. But we've got to be truthful and honest about what we can achieve and what we can't achieve. We've saved many lives, protected the lives of countless mothers and fathers, and we must never forget that. 
for the greatest achievement is not that we've kept the Abortion Act out of Northern Ireland or won an important legal battle in Britain for the Glasgow midwives or kept a pro-abortion legislation at bay in the Republic of Ireland at all tragically last year. The greatest achievement is that we exist. We're a sign of contradiction. We are a movement. We are a people. Above all, we are hundreds and thousands of individual families who refuse to be dominated who are blooded but refuse to be bowed by the culture of death which so overwhelms the world. So, what are the take-home messages? Leadership. Support from priests. Parish missions. See if you can adopt, as Jim said, a clergyman. See if they'll have a parish, spot parish mission. And the first step is for us to go along and talk to the priest. You don't just have to persuade him yourself. Well, could, could we come and talk to you about it? And then contact Isaac. And, 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 and you know, it, it's easy. We, this is why staff are here. We, we've grown in our staff recently because of the tr prudent um, uh, stewardship of Bob Edwards and the fantastic fundraising of Gordon Kane and his focus on what's essential. Take home message, get young people to the youth conference. Take home message, think about being a leafleter, leader. Le We're looking for leaders. It's no good me asking for volunteers. I can't or organise your team in Hythe or Lytham or Crosby. We've got to have a leader there. So we're looking for leaders. Watch this certification campaign. Contact Catherine Hampton, take that on. General election, take that on. The prayer. There needs to be a declaration of total resistance to abortion, backed by openly, open prayer, led, I think, by the Catholic bishops of Ireland, starting with Catholic hospitals, even if they're forced to close, refusing to carry out abortions. And we should be having uh, people uh, joining the 40 Days for Life people, joining the Good Council Network people outside abortion clinics. You know, if we're going to really build a movement. And 20th anniversary of Evangelium Vitae, uh, 25th of March, Feast of the Annunciation in Catholic tradition. Um, 20th anniversary uh, by the, the great pro-life leader, St. John Paul II, great pro-life thinker. I think one of the things that I believe SPUC is good at is thought leadership. We were probably the first group to pass a policy motion opposing same-sex marriage. Uh, I, I think that may be true. Um, and I, I know that Campaign Life Coalition certainly opposes it too. And, and so these were very, very important. We, we've engaged in thought leadership. There's no thought leadership like you will see in Evangelium Vitae. If you haven't read it, make sure that you do. And how about Catholics, since this is a Catholic document, um, seeing if you can get a mass organised in your local area on the 25th of March to commemorate that uh, wonderful publication and to draw attention to it. Matthew McCusker drew my attention to uh, the author Antoine de Saint-Exubery uh, of Wind, Sand and Stars. And he writes in that, Water is worth its weight in gold. The smallest drop kindles in the sand the green spark of a blade of grass. If rain falls anywhere, a great exodus brings life to the Sahara. Modern Europe... Britain and the Catholic Church in many parts of the world, like the Sahara, seem to be a lifeless desert. Yet, just beneath the surface, life waits to be given the opportunity to spring forth. Our activists and other supporters are the leaders who are the seeds of this life, waiting to spring forth. Our dear chairman, Robin Haig, could not be with us this year. Let's make this year a very special year of redoubled activity and leadership to gladden his heart and to speed his full recovery in the months ahead. Thank you.